holds. That's a, that's a lot there. Yeah, that, that's uh, quite a lot, but I think it's extremely um, amazing. I actually have taken some really deep courses on psychology and um, how reality operates in the brain and, and basically what it does is, you know, there's so much information out there, but most of it gets deleted, filtered, and then you just get like a small percentage into your brain and that's reality. That's like the 3% of the electromagnetic field that you're seeing in, in, in your day-to-day -day, uh, reality. And uh, uh, most, if not, no, all of that, all of those filters, you know, are basically like your culture, your language, the country, if you have any religion, if you don't have a religion. So all of those things uh, are filtering all the uh, bits of information and then your the reality that you're experiencing is uh, based on, on, on these uh, filters, whatever goes through. There's a lot that just don't go through and, and you miss it. Thank you. Um, so it's, I mean, totally agree with um, the, the article that you just read, sir. Yeah, what I, what I like, what I find interesting about the article is I, it's, it starts off, you know, with the with the with the dude making the case, but whatever his name is, Lord, whatever, Fauntleroy there, Marsh Marsh Marshmeyer, uh, making a, a a a case for objective reality, and uh, I I there there was a study that was done recently that I found. Uh, I, I think I I saw it on a Jordan Peterson video. By the way, I don't know if you know. Have you heard of Jordan Peterson? No, never. He's he's a guy that uh, he's he's made a lot of splashes. He's a uh, Canadian professor who has been standing up against this whole call people by their genders that they wish to be, uh, and he's a he's a psychology uh, professor. But uh, he has this series of of lectures which I'm almost through, which is called the Architecture of Belief. <laughs> Really, really fascinating. But in this lecture, there's a study that uh, somebody did where they had people look at these these people playing bas a basketball game, and they're tossing the ball back and forth. And they asked the people watching, count how many times the basketball was tossed. And so they count. And then after they're done, they said, did you see the gorilla? What? <laughs> well, if you go back, and hardly anybody saw the gorilla. But a gorilla walks in and walks right up to the middle of the camera, stands there for about five seconds, whatever it is, and then walks off. But because people had select that what, what they have done is they've, they've selectively determined that this information, this data was the important data that uh, needed to be uh, analyzed. They totally missed the gorilla. So uh, the, the, the point of all this uh, is that language if if you change your language, if you if you make a concerted effort to change your language, you can actually change how you think. Like your thinking can become naturally a part of of what you intellectually think. Are there are there words and phrases that when you hear somebody say, like even if they're uh, an anarchist, a libertarian, and you instantly think to yourself, no, nope, you're still in the mindset. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's a ton and and you know just going back to the video of the gorilla, um, we have actually used that video. Um, oh. I'm a consultant. I'm a consultant and I teach uh, leadership development and we've taught that as a form of uh, scotoma that sometimes we mm -hmm. just are blinded right. to everything else. Uh, and I have had people getting really pissed at me, telling me that I showed them different videos. <laughs> so you've experienced it firsthand. So you know exactly what i'm talking about now i did yeah. i didn't get to see the video first because i he explained this thing and then later on he played the video which i i'm 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 i won't say i'm totally positive but i'm i'm i would say i'm probably 99 percent sure that i would not have seen that gorilla <laughs> i would yeah. have counted the, the 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 passes you know i think that the only reason why i actually saw the gorilla is because of a little of a, a add that i have you know, so counting the passes, like I was like, what, 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 what? Oh, what, gorilla, what? Oh, the gorilla so, got in your. Maybe the gorilla got in your way. Yeah, yeah. That could have been so, it. Yeah. Because I couldn't like focus completely on on the task. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. You couldn't focus. That's what it is. 
so the people who couldn't focus see more stuff. There you go, folks. There you go. When you focus like a laser, you don't see more stuff. So, like I'm even with my fidget spinner, you know. Oh no! Like, I, oh, no. I have to have movement. I, like, that's, that's... They didn't say there would be a fidget spinner on this show. It's... Oh well, then it's a midget spinner. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's a see. It's a midget spinner is okay. I'm not triggered now. See, that's how language works. But there is like when we think about uh, we think about law. When we talk about law, even even folks that are sort of you know in the anarchist uh, libertarian circle, there there tends to be uh, an elevation of law in in the way that we describe something legal, something uh, uh, binding uh, that I believe reflects this. It's, it's like, and, and even for me, I think you, you, you still have, unless you were one of the fortunate few who early on escaped the paradigm, the course of enterprise paradigm, you, you, you still uh, almost always have like this one little foot that's in the door or in, in that camp. So when you speak about, you know, well, well, you know, it's against the law. You can't do it. You don't even think about it. You're like, well, it's against the law. Come on, man. You it, it's it's when you when you hear that you're like that that would be a part where you would look at that and say okay uh i have to be aware that i use that phrase so when i'm going to start to use that phrase i'm going to have to change how i use that phrase or or what i say in place of that to help my mind to basically to re uh recalibrate my mind to not produce verbiage that reinforces the status mentality. Oh, absolutely. And I can tell you just a quick story about that. Uh, so I'm driving and I have my kids and I have my niece and she says, we should buckle up because it's the law. Ah. I did not say anything. I swear. And my kids were like, we don't buckle up because it's the law. We buckle up because we want to be safe. Nice. So, right. So, Yes, that's great. So your kids... I didn't have to say anything. I was just kind of like internally kind of like, yes. But, and you think, well, your kids are lucky that they're being exposed to this thought which exists outside of the coercive enterprise model. But you think about the power of language to condition. <laughs> and that kid, that, that, that nobody has to tell that kid when you say, well, it's the law. You're not, you, don't, you don't have to explicitly sit down and tell that kid, listen... What we need to do is we need to give a supernatural adherence to this thing called law. Uh, whatever we hear word, the word law, we must supernaturally uh, submit to it because it has powers and abilities beyond our mere human understanding. But, but that's the power with it, right? Yeah. And if you're going to escape the, 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 the status paradigm, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to listen to especially words like law. What are what are some other words that you that that you would identify and say if you're using this word? And and I, and I, I want to put a caveat there and say I'm not talking about people being uh, uh, language purists and uh, going. Ah, 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 ah. I, I I just mean for you yourself to have an internal discipline to say when you're using what what are some of the words that you would hear and say, dude. Or if for yourself, if you hear yourself using that word, you say, dude, that's that's not the paradigm that I live in. Yeah, and I think it's just it's even beyond the words. It's, it's kind of like uh, the, the uh, modus operandi of people's brains and, and and even like their results in life, if you will. Um, they, they show a lot of that. I, I guess uh, some of the words, it's more like, you know, your brain can only understand positive. So if people, whenever they're, uh, I, I, and I cannot give you specific examples of the words that I find, but what I can tell you is that uh, the way I can see these patterns is I don't want to do this or because I don't want to get caught or because I don't think it's a good idea. So like when people um, present their position in a, in a negative way, uh, your brain does not understand negatives. So it, it's going to find ways to deliver 
what you're wanting to manifest. So they're continuously and perpetually getting into trouble or they're having results that they don't want. So whenever I see me or hear people uh, using the, the negative languages, um, words or whatever, uh, that's, that's when I am like, okay, no, I mean, you're, you're kind of still stuck. So like your brain and one way to master is like, I don't want to do this. Maybe saying, maybe I want this. Like, so that's how you recalibrate your brain to, instead of running away from something, you're going towards something. Yeah. Right. So you're changing it from, I don't want to do this to, I prefer to do. And really it's like what you're, we're talking about your kids when your kids were talking about, uh, the seatbelts, uh, they, they could actually up their game a little and, and be even more positive with, uh, how they thought about it. Well, we, we, we put on seatbelts because it, it, it allows us to feel safer and uh, we know that we can relax a little bit more because if something happens, we have protection, some degree of protection. Yeah. So that would be changing. Are you following me there? Or am I making sense? Total sense. Total sense. I, you know, uh, and I think that's basically what it is. So going from um, the idea of something you don't want to something that you want, and this is, uh, unequivocally takes me to the idea that like when I see that people kind of haven't been able to solidify their philosophy is when they perpetually have this hate towards the state. So well, yeah, I mean, I understand Good. that like, I get it. Yeah, that's horrible. So what are you going to do about it? What is your solution? Are you just whining? Are you just passing on the book of why you are not successful in the world to there is this state, you know, I mean, is that like like your scapegoat, or you know uh, you're, you're turning around and, and seeing what you want to fight for, what you want to accomplish, what you want to create? So, in two, we're working on two levels. Yes, as an anarchist, you dislike the state, but as an anarchist, you're, I think that you want to have a very healthy desire for something instead of the state. So. Instead of saying, I'm an anarchist, I hate the state, I'm like, I'm an anarchist, I love the market. Great. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I, when I brought you on, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're absolutely right. And actually, I am somewhat guilty of this, where I will lament uh, the state. I, 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 hopefully, I'm not, uh, I'm not too bad with it, but uh, it is something that, yeah, I mean, that, that's a powerful way to change your paradigm, to... In, in a sense, when you, I, I mean, I'm sure that you have your moments where you're frustrated and you see what's going on, uh, especially when you see, you know, another bombing and how many people are killed. And you see people over here, your freaking neighbors that are celebrating. Uh, and it's, it's, I don't know for you, but for me, it, it disgusts me. It, it grieves me, actually, uh, when I see this, this celebration of murder and kidnapping and rape and pillage and plunder. Uh, but I'm, I mean, I, I would say I would, I would, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure. Would you say that you, you have those moments where you're a little ticked off that day at what you We said? all have them. I mean, that's unequivocal. You know, we're human. We're going to have emotion. We're going to have desire. We're going to have frustration. So we're going to have a, 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 you know, a myriad of, uh, I guess, feelings and sensations. But I think that, um, you know, th there's this wonderful, um, formula that I learned, and it, it is thoughts plus feelings equal emotions. So once you have this formula, you're able to have the result that you want by training on like what you're thinking. So you have to be like really aware of what you're feeling and have words for it, and then adding your thoughts, and it will create your emotions and your experience of life. Because two people can go through the same stuff, and both of them will talk about it differently. Why? Because of that equation, that formula that I gave you. So I think it's of paramount importance that people don't live in autopilot, but they instead are able to understand this formula and, and able to give meaning to their own lives by choosing their own thoughts instead of just being bombarded by uh, all of these uh, phenomena, you know? They're just passive receivers, and uh, they become 
the language. They become the culture rather than they become an actor on the language, an actor on the culture. And absolutely. And the set and this is this is the way that most people are. Uh, I, I at least in America, I don't have a huge experience in other countries and cultures. So I, I, I mean, I don't know how different it is in other places if there are cultures where, where people tend to be more self-aware. I don't think that's the case, but it does seem like we've created a condition for, for non-self-awareness. I, I kind of, in a way, I, I kind of stumbled upon this because I was classified as being bipolar 15 some odd years ago. And I went through something called cognitive behavioral, thera behavioral therapy. Now, I've kind of modified my own version of it, uh, but uh, it, it's a process essentially where you're mapping out why you feel. And when, once you map out why you feel, then you're identifying what can you do to change it. Now, I think the missing element, at least for me, is I'm, I, I've, I'm a bit of a stoic I've, in, a, in, a, in the literalist sense of the term. Is the, the one part is to, have, to, to be resolved when you realize that there's something going on that's out, outside of your control. But mapping it out, uh, you have an emotion and you say, well, why am I feeling this? And you you get to the root of why you're feeling it, and and most of the time you can figure out uh, what 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 core driver within you is out of balance, and then you can have a much more realistic assessment of what it is that you have to change the condition, or if you can't change the condition, to come to some sort of inner peace that okay, this is <laughs> there's nothing I can do about this. It's 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 beyond my control but it was in that process that i began to I, I, all i was trying to do was identify when i had a high emotion and when i had a low emotion but then yeah. it started to spill over into why do i believe this why do i think that why do i assume this and these are the questions that we don't ask ourselves and getting back to being angry with the state when you're when you're living in anger I, I i i think well well let me ask you this you're yeah, in, yeah. in your coaching how do you how do you coach people regarding being governed by anger how do you do you have a um, methodology to, to to get outside of that i well first we explain what anger is and anger has its roots uh, primarily and, and feeling like you're, you're like, for instance, if you put a lot of work into something and you're not being considered, so lack of consideration, like lack of being seen, like, of, uh, like if somebody takes advantage of you, you know, so it, it comes, uh, from a place of lack basically. So one thing that is extremely important as well here is that like, you know, the reaction and then just the word itself reaction. When something happens to you, you react, you get angry, you get pissed. Now, the more aware you become, the less uh, bullshit that uh, happens around you. And, and let me explain this. So between stimulus and response, there is the gap. And the more aware you become, the wider that gap becomes. You know, some people have it like this. They're like so reactive. So what you do is to, like, we help them see that gap and we help them um, increase that gap through certain tools that we give them. And, and, and by doing so, people don't react anymore. They're not just uh, slaves of the emotion. They, uh, they become um, more of the agents of, um, like, they have agency, basically. So th there is something that happens. And they're like, you know, something that I actually tell people to do is just like anything that happens, just, hmm, you know, like, what is this all about? What meaning am I putting into this situation? And then, like, I mean, obviously, if somebody punches you in the face, that's kind of like, you don't want to just. You hmm probably it, right? don't need to. Hmm on that. Well, maybe you do, but most likely you don't. But there might be a condition where you do. But yeah, you know, like, for instance, if I'm outside in the lawn. Uh, on a nice chair and my son pours some hot water on, I mean, some cold water on my head. 
and someone my wife's hit, like she may be kind of like, oh, that's refreshing. And I might be like, I'm so pissed. You know, it's exactly <laughs> the same action on just two different people. How do you respond to that? Do you respond or do you react? You know, so it, it, it's the kind of stories that you're telling yourself and, and what makes you react or respond. So another thing that we actually tell them is, for instance, whenever they're not being considered and they feel like they have the anger, we tell them, you know, tell me your story as the victim. And then they tell you, oh, that's going wrong, whatever. And then we turn around and say, tell me the same story, but as if you were the hero. And they're like, what the hell? So they tell me the huh, story. That's great. And, and it just changes. And I'm like, okay, you are the hero. You're here to fix this. You're here to whatever is the situation. But again, it's always here, you know, nowhere else. It's the stories that you're telling yourself and, and the meaning that you put in those words. Right. And, and knowing that, that it is always here, that is, that, that's not creating subjective gobbledygook. That's empowering you to make the world around you. That's, and I mean, it's, I, I, I know that, I mean, I went through a long process of, of coming to, I, you're never done coming to self-actualization. It's, it's never over. Right. There's, there's huge parts of myself that are vast, uncharted territory that I'm totally unaware of. But, yeah. but, but I went through this process of, of, of becoming more self-aware, e even in little things. Like I would talk about, uh, we have a tendency to create these different versions of ourselves, work self, husband self, with kids self. And we take these selves with us in all these different parts of our lives where we go. And, and, and uh, when we go to that place where, where this self is in action, all the other parts of ourselves have disappeared. And, and actually getting to a point where you, you, uh, you can't accomplish this entirely, but getting to a point where you can actually take more of the fullness of yourself with you, at least for me, was an incredibly difficult process. I would have to go through deliberate exercises where I would stop and I wrote, I wrote things down that I would, you know, look at, okay, uh, like when I'm, uh, and work was the big frontier where that was the hardest place. I picked the hardest place where the totality of myself, you always go for the hardest thing first because then the others just kind of fall. And uh, so I would go to work and I would write down these questions, you know, uh, observe the things around you. How does this relate to uh, this version of you, this version of you, this version of you? And I literally had to do that for five years before I finally started to feel like wherever I went, I had more of fullness of myself around me. And I don't know if you've experienced anything like that or, or if that's part of your training, this, this having the totality of self with you. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as that goes, I actually went the, um, not just the psychological route, but I did some entheogens. Uh, what, what's that? To, entheogens, uh, teaching plants. Entheogens is a word that means uh, that they let you see the God within. Okay. So for instance, like ayahuasca, San Pedro, psilocybin, uh, all of these wonderful teachers that uh, help you uh, recapitulate and bring everything back uh, that you've lost along the way so you can come back to fullness, which is what you're talking about. And that's funny enough how I became an anarchist. I used to be a Ron Paul supporter. And, you know, the very first time I did some Pedro Cactus, I was like, holy smokes, so wait, the state's <laughs> not needed. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, like, and, and so I guess I had a little bit of a um, help with with um, teaching plants in that regard. But yeah, I mean, I think it's super important to be able to, I mean, like I was telling you earlier, you never really own anything. The only right. thing that you have right. is, is yourself. And if you don't have yourself, then you're screwed. Well, unless you prefer not to be owned and you could, you could prefer that. Uh, and I actually... I don't know. Maybe it's another show. You come back another time. Uh, I, I think that uh, people, much more than maybe we would like to admit or face, that they're more aware of the decision that they've made to be docile, to be passive, than we realize. And they actually prefer what they're experiencing. 
And you know, it's, this isn't something. It's it's a, it's a thought that I'm playing around with. I won't necessarily say, "Oh yeah, totally, I'm right." But I, I I'm I'm suspecting more and more that folks are quite happy that that at some deep level that they understand the cost that they're paying for what it is that they they perceive that they get out of the deal, which is security, which is uh, not having to. I think the biggest thing is not having to face. Uh, uncertainty and responsibility. Those are the two biggest things I think that people avoid in life. And the state, <laughs> it offers that in spades. It's, it, you, you know, your, your neighbor down the street, they're, you know, they're old and they need taken care of. You don't have to worry about it. The state's got it. It's not your responsibility. It's not your responsibility to take care of your neighbors. You know, the state's got it. I don't know if you're, if you're with me on that or <laughs> you're looking at me a little like, what the <laughs> yeah no um it's kind of funny because uh, my wife and i are kind of like the parents of uh the block because all the kids come here all the time and, and you know we end up feeding them and entertaining them and all of that because they like the freedom that we offer uh which you know most times they can't have in their own houses we have a wonderful backyard where they get to play and do all sorts of uh crazy things but i think that you're right when you say that most people are afraid of freedom for those reasons. However, the the double bind which appears everywhere in life is that there is no security with the state either. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they're living in a mirage. Absolutely. But another thing is, you know, like we were talking about the whole belief system, uh, which, you know, the initials are BS. Um, people tend to uh, believe that you know, the state will be there for them and whatever. And, but it's just more, even it's just a very costly and useless middleman. And yeah, I mean, like, dude, like we, it gets to, see, most people are so generous and they will be happy to do all, all sorts of things. There's so much volunteering, there's so much giving. And, and especially as people are having more money, they feel able to give more. You know, so, I mean, the state is already on its way out. So I'm not even worried about that. Yeah, and, and I think it's a very practical reason why people are so giving. Because when you give, you receive. It's, it's, I mean, it's a cliche, but it's absolutely true. And actually being self-aware, knowing that uh, when you give, uh, you receive, it, it, uh, <laughs> I, I think it... Uh, it creates more powerful intentionality behind the giving to be aware that now I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you out, Luis, because I know in helping you out, I'm, I'm going to get something from it. I don't even know all the time what I'm going to get out of it. I, I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure you have too. You've, if, if anybody has done any type of uh, mentorship or anything along that line, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm with what you do, or you, you, you do by definition, you, you know that in the process of that mentorship, in the process of that giving, that person or people, they, they will take you, they will challenge you, they will, they will really make you think about what you think, what you believe, why you're acting a certain way, and you will, you will grow in phenomenal ways by mentoring somebody else. Uh, and you don't even know, but you know it. I'm sure that you've experienced this many times. And I think that's, that's part of the the core of what it means to be human we understand at a biological reality level that giving is good for us <clears throat> giving is not only good for us it's good for larger groups around us and if it's good for larger groups around us larger groups around us that are prosperous that are doing well that means that we have an opportunity to prosper and do well it's like if you want to go into business uh and you really don't care about people around you. If everybody had that uh, uh, approach, there would be no customers. <laughs> you, you need customers, so you have to lift people up. I want to switch gears here because we're just about out of time here. I just want to talk briefly about uh, your emancipated, emancipated human. I almost said it again. <laughs> I didn't. I keep wanting to say, I know it's nothing to do with humanism. I keep saying that. Stop it, Paul. Stop it. See, that's, I have to retrain my brain to, 
<laughs> You're doing a great job. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about where, where – because I think you guys are doing a little bit different. You started to do a podcast recently, right? Uh, yes, yes. I, I the, I second episode, been... the second episode. We call it an episode issue, whatever. What, what's it called? Whatever. Word. Second show, man. Second show. I listened to your second show. Good stuff. Thank you for and listening. I, and I like the twelve minutes, whatever, fifteen. I like that. It's short. You know, I like you know short. Everybody's busy, and I just you know like throw 10, 12 minutes out, just like highlights why I think certain things are important, and you know move on with your day. Um, it seems like. Uh, like everything is so uh, disposable these days. And even Facebook, you know, posts are disposable within a day. So yeah, I yeah. think it's. I'm, I'm in the to... news business. I understand disposable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's important to keep uh, the attention, you know, like just like me and my ADD. And, and most people just like, there's so many things that you have to do and like, okay, make it fast. What is it all about? So that's kind of the whole deal. But if I may. I think it's important that I go back to what you were saying on giving just really briefly. Um, there is something like um, my dad was an engineer, entrepreneur, self-employed, uh, super hardworking. And, and I got that, um, that gene, that little um, disease of the mind called wanting to create value at all costs. <laughs> so it's a good disease. You know, I, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. It, it's a beautiful virus. And so I, I um, at some point, uh, we all have, um, we grow and, and our perspective of life is, goes from me to us, to all of us. And the self-actualization, whenever you get there is when you're able to see the big picture of all of us. And this is no socialist thing. This is reality. Have you read the book, Tribal Leadership? Actually, I have it somewhere in here, and that's next in yeah, line. It, it, it goes through that hierarchy. It's a really brilliant book. That's nice. That I, well, then I'll read it. Um, so basically, the, the idea is uh, I, I wanted to be able to just be the best because I want to be the best for, my, for myself and then, you know, fuck whatever. But then I was able to understand that uh, my, my responsibilities, my connections with, you know, the family, with uh, – uh, my, my immediate social community and, and, and just the entire world and the universe at once. And, and that's part of like, you know, the entheogens, like you become really aware of your connection and, and, and uh, the vortex that happens. So at any rate, I saw during an ayahuasca ceremony that um, it did not matter how high I got in, in my, my um, way, my self discovery, I would never be able to go any higher as the lowest people that uh, just because right. of kind of like the nature. Yes. And, and yeah. So, you you, you got to read tribal leadership. It's all, it's all, it's all in there. Yes. And the idea that I, that I saw that ayahuasca showed me is that to be able to grow and go even higher and expand myself, I have to come down and empower all of these people. Right. Yes. And then I will be yes. able to get, much higher and, and to achieve more and to do all these things. So, but at the same time, it's no longer just for me and my self um, desire and my, 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 you know, just uh, satisfaction. It's like the, the, the idea that I also get satisfaction by helping, by mentoring, by, by, by growing people. Uh, and, and so that, that idea that you're saying, you know, giving and you, you get a lot in return. Yes, you do. But that's just the side effect. I don't, I, I give so much, but I don't do it out of wanting stuff back. Stuff just, you know, comes back to me all the time. But my, my main purpose is to be able to provide value and not just in a business sense, but also in, in whatever but, but, form. But if you're providing value, you're not doing it in a void. You're doing it because it satisfies something within you. You're still doing it for yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything yeah. you do is for yourself. You can't avoid it. Absolutely. But I guess the point I'm trying to make, and maybe I didn't explain it right, is not just for me. Like, it makes me so happy, and I have, like, lots of energy, and it just keeps me going, like, fueled up. Um, and it's not just a kratom. It, it's, um, <laughs> good, good, good qualifier. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, it, it's just this desire to, to uh, you know, the bodhisattva ideology, being able to be here to help others 
experience what I have been given, you know, like like to, to self-actualization. So that in itself is uh, satisfactory for me. Yeah, and so, I, 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 I haven't explored this in detail, but I've, uh, in the back of my mind, I'll get to it maybe someday, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've thought, I've toyed around with the thought that uh, I believe that self-actualization, that individualism and self-actualization uh, it leads to uh, nurturing of the people around you. Uh, because, like you said, you come to that actualization that you can only go so far. You know, I, I, I happen to, uh, I mean, I've, I mean I, I've experienced this. I'm sure with that we've all <laughs> experienced this in, in my work life, in my family life, in different aspects of my life. I, could, I can look at you know, my level of development is, is hmm, there's, there's almost always a direct correlation between the people that I'm surrounded with and, and how they're developing, how we're all developing as a group. Uh, it's individualism leads to, <laughs> dare I say it, individualism leads to cooperation with people around yes. you. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, we're we're just about out of time here. It's been awesome having you on here. Uh, we're 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 gonna have to. I'd like to have you back again sometime with my my my. Uh, well, he's on a lot of my shows. Andrew Andrew Marich, love to have you on, and uh, uh, maybe maybe an ice date or something else. But uh, it's been, I love that. It's been great having you on the show, uh, and you were a good sport because you just kind of went with the subject and that was awesome and where where can we find your uh, or your uh contact information i know there's eman emancipatedhuman.com right yes sir and also you know i have the facebook page emancipated human uh with fernando misses on facebook and i guess that's that's about it i also am a co-proprietor of uh, vias for voluntary my friend jason bassler um, founded it and uh, he pulled me in when it was about 4,000 likes and we've been climbing along. Um, so, yeah, and I also work with uh, Jeff Berwick, uh, Dollar Vigilante. I sell Kratom online. I, actually, the Kratom that I sell is made specifically for me by the guy that brought Kratom to the States 25 years ago. Wow. So, well, that's so, nice. Like, so I got that yeah. going for me. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly all right yeah uh and so so facebook are you on twitter yeah emancipated h emancipated h and uh and and for me everybody as i always say in our shows you can find everything about me all my connections all the shows i do all the facebook and everything at it's real easy to remember is tv dot me that's <laughs> simple isn't that simple is tv dot me so well, uh, we'll see you on the next Viz Previous, whenever and wherever that is, and tonight on 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 this page as well on the Liberty Principle. I will be co-hosting with the Professor Rambo, Dimitri. We will be doing full auto, and we're going to talk about the military is looking at uh, incorporating the 308, and we're going to look at what Czechoslovakia did recently when it told uh, its quote unquote citizens. There's a word. Right, <laughs> there's a word. Uh, uh, when it told its citizens the 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 best uh, protection against terrorism is to arm yourselves, so we'll talk about that. And I thank you again, uh, Luis, for being on this previous. Everybody, good night, everybody. <laughs>